So by their own definition, are they not, in this case, the very white saviors that they so desperately seek to condemn? In their righteous quest for racial justice, have they not become the very thing that they sought to destroy? All right, so I've been wanting to talk about the white savior complex for a while now because just like with the concept of white privilege, the discourse around this subject has just never really sat right with me. Similar to the mainstream discourse's claims around inherent white racism and inherent white privilege, the mainstream discourse around white saviorism seemed to me to just be another attempt to try to punish white people for being white. Except in this case, the white savior complex accusations felt like an even more aggressive indictment of white people because now the objective was to criminalize them for attempting to do what we've been telling them is the right thing to do and actually use their positions in society to go out of their way to help minority communities. But as I'm going to try to discuss here, there is actually some merit to this idea's claims. Just like with the concept of white privilege, some of my aversion to the concept of white saviorism was indeed unjustified. My limited understanding and unwillingness to actually delve into this issue because of how it was so thoughtlessly being discussed in the mainstream left me with an incomplete conceptualization of the topic. But of course, as always, I do believe that there are significant fallacies embedded within this concept that must be addressed as well. But with all of that said, let's just get into the discussion. So what is the white savior complex? Well, first, a bit of history. So apparently one of the original conceptualizations of white saviorism was actually derived from a poem titled The White Man's Burden, written in 1899 by English poet Rudyard Kipling. Now, of course, the practice of white saviorism itself predates even this poem. Obviously, this ideal had existed for centuries before and is part of the reason why the colonial expansion of the Western world occurred in the first place. Nevertheless, Kipling's poem is considered to be one of the first literary works to completely encapsulate this ideal. In the poem, Kipling implores the U.S. to assume colonial control over the Philippines after the islands were annexed as a result of the Spanish-American War. Instead of respecting the Philippines' declaration of independence, Kipling argues that it is the duty of the white Western world to bring civilization to the various non-white, non-Western cultures of the world. And so the US should claim the territory as its own. The poem also self-aggrandizes the extreme personal cost that such an endeavor would exact upon the Western world. But because this is the moral obligation of the white man, these costs must be met with fortitude and resolve. And even though there was significant backlash to Kipling's writings from prominent anti-imperialist authors like Mark Twain, the poem was eventually used as justification for America's invasion of the Philippines. And so the idea of the heroic white man coming in to save the indigenous people from themselves was mass marketed. And it is this iteration, the original iteration, that is steeped in racism and white supremacy. And as such is an ideal that I believe must be denounced. Unfortunately, many articles today argue that movies like Avatar and Dances with Wolves are simply modern interpretations of the white man's burden. And herein we identify the first major fallacy of the mainstream discourse surrounding the white savior complex. Again, according to the actual architect of this principle. The white man's burden is the moral obligation of the white Western world to bring civilization to the non-white, non-Western world and save them from themselves. It definitively does not imply that the white man's obligation is to help non-white communities fight against other oppressive white colonialist structures. That is what we are telling white people to do. In Avatar, the movie's main white character, Jake Sully, starts out as basically a human manifestation of Kipling's colonial colonialist beliefs. He is a willing member of Earth's military industrial complex, which is basically just a stand-in for the American military industrial complex that is seeking to subjugate the indigenous people of an alien planet, the Navi, and exploit them for their resources. But through his exposure to their beliefs, culture, and lifestyle, he comes to abhor his own culture's values. So much so that he eventually decides to betray his own people and fight alongside the Navi. The entire message of this movie could be boiled down to indigenous and quote uncivilized people good, American American imperialism bad. Compare this to Kipling's thesis of American imperialism good, indigenous and quote uncivilized people bad. And you can see why the claim that this movie is just a modern interpretation of the white man's burden is completely invalid. Avatar and movies like it are complete antitheses of that original understanding of the concept. The only similarity between these modern movies and the original white man's burden is that you have a white individual helping or saving non-white people. But the objectives and implication of that help literally could not be any 
more diametrically opposed in terms of how that help characterizes non-white people and cultures. One seeks to venerate and uplift, while the other seeks to denigrate and condemn. Nevertheless, similar to the concept of racism, the definition of white saviorism has evolved since Kipling's iteration of the ideal. And if you've seen my video on the fallacy of inherent white racism, then you know exactly how I feel about the evolution of these terms and concepts without proper scrutiny and examination to guide their usage. In any case, as we just confirmed, the concept of the white savior has existed for decades now. But the term itself caught fire in 2012 after Nigerian American author Teju Cole used the phrase the white savior industrial complex in a series of tweets to condemn Jason Russell and his nonprofit Invisible Children after their video Coney 2012 went viral. At the time, Coney 2012 had just become the most watched video in internet history and had justifiably sparked outrage and backlash against Ugandan warlord Joseph Coney from communities all over the world. And so, in his own words, Cole took to Twitter without much premeditation and focused his response on Russell and on white people in general, alleging that this whole endeavor was just a result of white people's need to use these experiences to quote, validate their privilege. Now, if you've seen any of my videos, then you likely already know that I could not disagree more with Cole's assessment here. It seems to overlook the fact that this, yes, white man traveled to a foreign country, met with the people, listened to their fears, promised to help them, provided an opportunity for them to speak directly to those who could support them, raised over $3 million for their cause, and managed to get the president of the United States of America to commit to sending aid to them. All of which resulted in Kony's eventual exodus from the Ugandan region and an 80% decrease in the amount of atrocities committed by him and his followers. So despite the fact that, sure, Joseph Kony was never arrested and is likely still at large, his influence has virtually been exterminated and his army is on the brink of collapse thanks in large part to Jason Russell and his nonprofit. By no means was Coney 2012 a perfect movement, but it did have an undeniable effect. So instead of focusing on Russell's actions and what he actually managed to accomplish for the people he promised to help, Cole asks us instead to focus on the fact that Russell is a white man. And once we understand this, the only conclusion for us to draw is that the sole reason that Russell did what he did was to quote, validate his own privilege. And it is this iteration of the white savior complex that we discuss in the mainstream today. The one that inherently takes issue with the narrative of white person helping or saving non-white people, regardless of the form that this help takes or what it actually results in for the group being helped. And given this country's complex and problematic history with racism, I do think that it's completely fair to be skeptical about anything, be it a demonstration of political activism or a movie that features this narrative. But as we just saw, and as we'll continue to see, problems often arise whenever we make accusations about something based entirely upon its narrative structure and not the actual substance of the thing itself. Nevertheless, despite the fundamental issue of the white savior complex being this narrative of white person helping or saving non-white people, there are still varying definitions and understandings of the concept. Some definitions argue that the fundamental issue with white saviorism is the alleged fact that these saviors will make the act of helping somebody else all about themselves. Others argue that the problem stems from these saviors not understanding the history, culture, political affairs or actual needs of the people that they're trying to help. Some definitions assert that the problem is with the white savior's mindset, in that they typically approach these situations from a place of superiority, while others claim that the real issue is that these saviors often rob the individuals or groups that they're trying to help of any real agency in achieving their own salvation. And just to be clear, even though, as I already mentioned, I take issue with loosely defined concepts in general, I don't actually have a problem with any of these individual stipulations. Regardless of whether you are black, white, or or anything in between. I 100% agree with the sentiment that we should never take anyone else's plight and make it all about ourselves. We should always try to understand the issues before offering our assistance. We should never assume ourselves superior to those we seek to help. And we should never rob anyone of their agency in any regard, let alone in our attempts to help them. And are there examples of white people violating these principles? Absolutely. I do not dispute this fact in the slightest, but do I believe that these problems are specific to the white community? Of course not. And I believe that there is a very necessary discussion that needs to be had about the racist assumption that it is. But I largely covered this conversation in my Inherent White Racism video, so feel free to check that out if you would like more context. Nevertheless, there are prominent examples of white people violating these principles, especially in media. For example, I haven't actually watched the movie Hidden Figures, but I am very aware of its racial controversies. Apparently that infamous scene where Kevin Costner's character destroys the colored ladies room sign never actually happened. And if that's all there was to this scene, I don't think there'd be a problem with it. Films add scenes that never really happened in real 
real life for dramatic purposes all the time. Unfortunately, however, this specific scene diminishes the real life actions of Katherine Johnson, the black female NASA mathematician at the center of this story. According to the book that the movie was based on, Johnson refused to so much as enter the colored bathrooms. And as far as she can tell, nobody ever tried to make her do so. And considering the time period, her defiance in this regard would have put her directly in harm's way. And so shifting the focus away from her courage and resolve in refusing to use the colored restrooms, and instead giving credit to a supervisor who never even existed for desegregating those restrooms, ultimately undermines the significance and the bravery of Johnson's actions. The movie screenwriter defends this scene by arguing that there need to be white people who do the right thing, there need to be black people who do the right thing, and someone does the right thing. And so who cares who does the right thing, as long as the right thing is achieved? And if this was a fictional story, I would wholeheartedly agree with this sentiment. But this isn't a fictional story. And the reality is that nobody did the right thing for Katherine Johnson, and she still had to persevere nonetheless. And so including a scene where somebody actually does the right thing for her ultimately undermines her perseverance. And in the end, this scene undeniably robs her of her agency in achieving her own salvation, a clear violation of that fourth definition. Other movies like The Help and The Blind Side are also guilty of this violation, as both of these movies are based on minority characters whose real life counterparts claim that these movies misrepresented them and their relationships with the white people in their lives, often inflating the role of the white character to being more significant than it actually was. Although I should note for legal reasons that in the case of The Help, the black woman who one of the story's main characters was based off of actually sued the author of the book for using her likeness and image without her permission, but eventually lost the suit, despite the uncanny similarities between the character and her real life counterpart. Nevertheless, it is an undeniable fact that these violations occur, especially in the world of media, and that yes, there are very prominent examples of white people being guilty of them. And as I mentioned earlier, my distaste for the general discussion around white saviorism prevented me from acknowledging these facts, especially when they concern movies that I actually have seen, like Green Book, the story of a black musician, Dr. Donald Shirley, and his white driver, Tony Vallelonga. According to the family of Dr. Shirley, this film was, quote, a symphony of lies, and the film's portrayal of the heartwarming friendship between the two men was a complete fabrication. Nick Vallelonga, the son of Tony Vallelonga, was a lead writer on the screenplay, and never gave the family any substantial evidence that Dr. Shirley had actually given permission for the movie to be made, and they weren't consulted in any capacity during the movie's production. And this is all while Dr. Shirley's nephew, Edwin, maintains that Shirley had actually refused Nick's offer when he first approached him 30 years ago. And so from the evidence we have so far, it would seem that this is a situation where a man used the life and struggle of another man without the blessing of that man or his family in order to tell a glorified story about his own father, which is undeniably a violation of that first definition, making somebody else's story and plight all about yourself. And so for this reason, Green Book, like The Help, The Blind Side, and Hidden Figures, is a problematic narrative. But as I went further into my research, I found other accusations being made against the film regarding its substance and what it was allegedly perpetuating within its plot structure, beyond this overarching fraudulent narrative. This article uses Green Book as an example to argue that white savior films reinforce a problematic social order, claiming that in the film, Dr. Shirley does nothing but submit to the whims of the white character, and that this is evidence that in these films, white characters propel the action forward, black characters simply react to it. Using an image of Tony literally driving the car as apparent evidence of white people driving the action forward. And I'm sorry, but as someone who has actually seen this movie, these observations are at best unintentionally ignorant and at worst willfully misrepresentative because throughout the film Dr. Shirley is unmistakably the driving force behind the action. It is Dr. Shirley who initiates the entire plot of the film by deciding to go on a dangerous tour into the American Deep South which as we later find out he did for an explicit purpose. It is Dr. Shirley who repeatedly challenges Tony not only on his behavior but also on his understanding of the world. It is Dr. Shirley who directly disobeys Tony's advice leading to one of the most impactful scenes in the movie. And perhaps most glaringly, it is Dr. Shirley who saves him and Tony from prison after Tony's lack of composure gets them in trouble. At no point in this movie is any white character propelling the action forward. At no point in this movie is Dr. Shirley just passively submitting to the whims of the white character. Everything happens because of Dr. Shirley's decisions. The impetus behind these characters coming to terms with one another and eventually becoming friends, which is again, the entire point of this movie, is driven by Dr. Shirley's action. And it is Tony who is forced to react to Dr. Shirley's world and eventually grow to understand it. And so when this article claims that the movie's explicit intent is to communicate to the audience the message of let white people take charge and everything will be alright, I am genuinely forced to question whether this article's author 
actually watch this movie because I personally find it difficult to conclude that a movie that repeatedly demonizes the overt and casual white racism of 1960s America directly calls out the problematic ways in which white people conceptualize blackness and places its black male lead in a position of authority over its white male lead going so far as to repeatedly depict the black lead lecturing reprimanding and even saving the white character is somehow communicating the message of let white people take charge and everything will be all right. I am sorry because I truly don't like to be direct in my accusations, but I genuinely believe that in order to make this type of assertion, one has to have either intentionally or unintentionally completely disregarded the insurmountable evidence within the substance of this movie that could have easily debunked this claim, and have instead only focused on the film's narrative structure. White person helping non-white person. Green Book is problematic because it tries to portray a fictional story as truth, not because it is secretly telling white people to take charge. And it is this focus on the narrative structure of these films that fails to take into account or consider the actual substance of these movies that, in my opinion, permeates the mainstream discussion around the white savior complex. This article argues that the main issue with Avatar, which is one of the most commonly referenced examples of white savior films, is that it is simply a rehearsal of white centering, which apparently occurs when white people put their feelings above the people of color because they're supposedly helping. It claims that the movie's director, James Cameron, chose to focus on the main white character character's emotional state rather than the actual suffering of the Na'vi people. And again, this claim seems to have been born of a surface level analysis of the film's narrative structure, which of course features a white character helping or saving non-white characters. But it doesn't seem to acknowledge certain elements of the film that could debunk this claim, like the fact that the emotional climax of the movie is the scene where the white invaders burn down the home of the Na'vi. I don't think it can be argued that what the audience is supposed to feel in this moment is unbridled sorrow for the Na'vi people, as well as utter disgust and disdain for the white invaders and the movie's main white character, Jake Sully, for betraying these people and bringing about this destruction. And according to James Cameron, this was the film's explicit purpose. In his own words, I wanted the audience to side with the indigenous people and see the humans as the invaders from space who were ravaging their world, a flip on all the aliens invade earth stories we grew up with. I was betting that through the power of cinema, the audience could be taken on a journey in which they became the enemy. And and maybe as a result saw themselves, however briefly, as nature sees us, alien, invader, destroyer. So again, I'm sorry, but I genuinely believe that the only way to claim that the movie's real focus was the main white character's emotional state is to intentionally disregard not only the substance of the movie, but also the explicit purpose of the movie, according to the director himself, and to only lay focus on the film's narrative structure of white person helping non-white group. Django Unchained is another alleged white savior film film because its narrative structure depicts a white person buying a slave's freedom, training him to become a bounty hunter, and subsequently sacrificing his life so that the former slave and his love interest can escape. This article argues that the film's white savior didn't take actions for the right reasons, because he allegedly only freed Django out of a sense of superiority. To prove this, the article selects a random text written by 17th century author Samuel Sewell and arbitrarily compares the film to the ideology espoused in the writing. Sewell argues against slavery, but for profoundly racist reason, claiming that blacks seldom use their freedom well. The article then states without any additional evidence that the movie Django Unchained holds a similar view of black people. Apparently, the existence of Sewell's writings and the existence of this movie are enough to link them in ideology. It doesn't matter that the story's plot is driven by Django's desire to rescue his wife and that the white savior has to acquiesce to Django's will. It doesn't matter that Django is repeatedly shown to be more capable than his alleged white savior. It doesn't matter that the white savior doesn't actually sacrifice himself for the couple, but actually jeopardizes their freedom by not being able to contain his own pride. It doesn't matter that Django has to free himself, outmaneuver the white slavers, and eventually rescue his wife on his own after the white savior's mistake. And of course, it doesn't matter that the same white supremacist sentiments that Sewell espouses are directly on display in this movie as the objective evil that needs to be overcome. Nope, simply because the narrative structure depicts a white man saving a black man, the entire film can be classified as a white white savior narrative and, as such, perpetuates white supremacy. Another film accused of perpetuating white supremacy due to its alleged depiction of the white savior complex is The Last Samurai. In fact, for many, especially in
especially in the modern era, this film is actually the patient zero of white saviorism. And as you can see, the central argument for this claim is that the white character learns the samurai's ways and saves them from being destroyed by the Japanese army by teaching them how to properly fight using their own techniques. And again, this analysis of the narrative structure is definitively not what is depicted in this movie. The movie's white character doesn't actually save them from being destroyed. The Japanese army is actually just an extension of the American colonial army, and so the movie's symbolic villain is American colonial expansion itself. The white character also doesn't teach them how to properly fight using their own techniques. It is their techniques and way of life that actually save him from the self-destructive path that he was on. His significance, like Jake Sully's in Avatar, comes from the fact that he was a high-ranking member of the very army that the non-white culture is trying to defeat, not simply because he is white or because he is better at their own techniques than they are. And perhaps most significantly, the film's Japanese audience were actually thrilled with the depiction of Bushido culture that the movie very carefully and thoughtfully portrayed, and were seemingly unbothered by the fact that the story was told through the white character's perspective, since for them it was obvious that the real star on display was Japanese history, heritage, culture, and way of life. Similarly, Dances with Wolves is also considered to be a white narrative film because the narrative structure depicts a white man, quote, going native, which is basically just a derogatory way of saying that a white man found value in a particular Native American culture and sought to emulate it. But just like with The Last Samurai, the movie actually had the support of the non-white community represented in the film behind it. And not just for its depiction of certain Native American cultures, but also for the impact that the movie had on Native American actors in the industry. And of course, the movie itself doesn't depict the white character as a savior in any capacity. Instead, the Sioux tribe actually rescues him from the colonial army after he was captured. And at the end of the movie, he voluntarily leaves the tribe because his presence would cause problems for them. So even though he's found family, friendship, love, and purpose with these people, in the end he puts their needs over his own. Which is exactly the message that we've been preaching, right? And so yet again, we see the substance of the film directly refuting the claims made against its narrative structure. And this is a bit of an aside, but I do think that it's important to acknowledge. Because I would actually defend people's right to maintain these white savior claims against movies like The Last Samurai and Dances with Wolves, regardless of what the Japanese or Native American communities have to say about it. If, of course, these allegations actually address the substance of the films and not just their narrative structures. Because in my opinion, truth is truth. It doesn't matter whose mouth it's coming from. If it's correct, then it's correct. End of story. But as it turns out, it seems that the people making these claims actually wouldn't defend their own right to hold such an opinion, seeing as their issue with white saviorism is their belief that white people come into these spaces from a place of superiority and inject themselves into these situations without first understanding the history, culture, political affairs, and actual needs of the people that they're trying to help. So when Cherokee actor Wes Studi praises Dances with Wolves and credits Costner and his team for respecting Native American history and culture, and Japanese actor Ken Watanabe credits The Last Samurai for honoring Japanese heritage, can it not be argued that the mostly white critic's displeasure with these films, which is objectively seeking to override these non-white communities' approval of these films, was in fact born of a lack of understanding of these people's actual needs, and a belief that their opinion is superior to the collective opinions of these communities. So by their own definition, are they not, in this case, the very white saviors that they so desperately seek to condemn? Them. In their righteous quest for racial justice, have they not become the very thing that they sought to destroy? And so this is just part of the reason why I believe it is so dangerous to focus entirely on a narrative structure when making these types of accusations. Whether in the realm of media or political activism, as we've repeatedly seen, in many cases the actual substance of the thing being accused outright debunks the claims being made against its narrative structure, even in problematic cases like Green Book. And so because of this, I don't think that the narrative structure of white person helping or or saving non-white people is inherently dangerous or problematic. I think that just like with any trope, this narrative structure can be done poorly and therefore can be problematic, but that doesn't mean that every single application of it is detrimental or racist. As with all things, it really comes down to the substance of the narrative and how it is ultimately executed. And so in the end, as I found with my deep dive into white privilege, I do believe that there is some merit to the idea of white saviorism, but I still maintain that many of the claims being made against the movies that 
allegedly perpetuate this ideal are ultimately unconvincing, and that they rely almost exclusively on narrative structure alone to defend the assertion, and in most cases, completely overlook the actual substance of these films. But in any case, I think that's gonna be it for this one. If you made it this far, thank you so much for indulging me. So at this point, I've made a video about the fallacy of inherent white racism, the belittling and dismissive assumptions of white privilege, and now the flawed concept of white saviorism. And I'm sure by now there are people who probably think of me as sort of a white knight for white people. And hey, I can't really blame them for thinking that. Obviously, I believe that if they actually paid attention to the substance of my arguments and not just the narrative structure of black guy defending white people, then that belief would cease to hold true for them. But still, that narrative structure does exist to some degree. So I can understand why some people might overlook the substance of my videos and come to that conclusion. The entire purpose of this video was to demonstrate that this is largely how we approach these types of conversations. But I just want to clarify that the reason I feel compelled to make these types of videos is because I genuinely want what the people I'm speaking against want, which I believe is a coalition of black people, white people, and everybody in between working together towards a resolution for these societal problems. And at this point, given the rampant polarization of virtually every societal talking point, I think it's fair to conclude that our current methods towards achieving this goal aren't really working. And I think that makes sense given the current nature of our public discourse, which is largely centered around shaming and blaming individuals for their actions, or in the case of white people, for their existence. And while I do think that it is extremely important to hold people accountable, no matter the individual or group, I genuinely believe that it is easier for people to acknowledge their compliance and or wrongdoing when the person pointing the finger is also trying to understand things from their perspective. And I think it's fair to say that in the mainstream discourse, we largely fail to do this. Because I think that if we did try to look at things from the perspective of white people, then we wouldn't be so brazen in the way that we talk about them and their alleged failings as an entire race. I believe that if we we truly believe in the principles that we constantly espouse and claim to be fighting for, then we simply wouldn't, and actually couldn't, approach these conversations in the manner that we do today. But I'm just going to end this one here before I go off for another 20 minutes on this topic, so I'll just say I do hope all of this made sense. As always, if it didn't, please feel free to let me know why so that I can try to address any misconceptions in the comments. But with that said, I wish you all the very best going forward, take care of yourself, and I will see you in the next one. Peace.